the Alaskan sky is as beautiful and can be as intimidating as the volcanic mountain peaks. The winds often howl over the tundra in the backcountry, but the weather in the summer is much more moderate on the ocean coast. Salmon anglers flock to the inlets and streams where coho kings and sockeye salmon run the rivers in August, relatively easy to catch. A total of nine salmon for the day caught by these two fellows from Missouri. Their first Alaskan salmon fishing adventure gave them a day they'll never forget. And we'll never forget our plane flight over the Alaskan range. Many an airplane has dropped into these craggy peaks or into the lonely mountain valleys, a reminder to all pilots that Alaskan weather must be respected at all times, especially in the mountains. A runway 175 miles west of Anchorage, you wouldn't expect a camp like this in such a remote setting. This is Osprey Mountain Lodge, owned by outfitter Gary Pogany. Everything had to be flown in, the portable sawmill, and even a bulldozer to keep the runway groomed. Airplanes are a necessity everywhere in Alaska. Gary flew us to a mountain plateau, which is one of the spike camps, as they're called. A 10 by 12 tent on the tundra, placed in the middle of travel routes of the barren ground caribou, this is where cameraman John Ford and I spent three phenomenal days. Here's a group of mixed-aged bulls that we saw several times, twice strolling within a hundred yards of our tent. Our second day in the mountains is when I finally had the chance at a caribou with a big rack. It wasn't as close as I'd like, but it was close enough. Look at this side. Got it. A combination of extreme nervousness, excitement, bull fever, and that's worse than buck fever. I've never taken such a large animal in such a remote location, and I knew the job ahead of me was going to be the toughest part of the hunt. Here's the hide. Drag that back. The head. This is going to be a heavy one. And the most important thing of all, the meat. Oh, we got five bags plus the ribs. Ah! Four hours of field dressing and boning out the meat, plus six hours of packing meat bags back to camp, and the job was almost over. The next day it took one more two-hour carry to bring the massive antlers back to camp. The inedible antlers go last in my list of priorities. Funny thing happened as we were carrying the antlers back to camp. We literally stumbled into a bull caribou that was larger than the one I took the day before and look how far away we were from our tent. If the winds of luck would have blown the other way, I could have taken a larger caribou within sight of our tent and carrying all that meat wouldn't have taken us into the night. But now the hunt was over and a monarch of a bull was marching towards us. Totally unaware that John Ford has set his camera on the tripod and he started grinding away, capturing its every move. Maybe 75 yards away when we first saw it, the bull's eyes, which aren't terribly good, didn't make out our outline as we sat in front of a small shrub. And what about scent on the tundra? Well, it's virtually irrelevant to a caribou. You can watch the wind blow the skin on its neck. The wind is howling. A caribou's small ears aren't really built for listening carefully. Besides, the wind is usually blowing too hard to hear anything clearly. The nose on a caribou is covered with hair. It's not shiny, wet, like a deer's. And a caribou's nose isn't really built for smelling predators. The reason is the wind, the updrafts and downdrafts in the mountains. By the time a caribou could smell a wolf or a bear, it would be too late. Now, except for the big bulls that travel alone in the fall, caribou move in groups and try to stay in the open where they can see a predator moving towards them. Now, this big boy appears to sniff the wind, but to no avail, it's blowing hard from the wrong direction to be of any help. 
He chews his cud as he walks. Caribou are constantly moving, constantly walking, even when they're feeding, they're on the move. This bull walked within 35 yards of John and I, never had an inkling of an idea that we were even on the same mountain. As it walked past, I wondered if I should try a trick that worked well in Quebec a year earlier, the old Indian trick of holding my arms above my head to imitate that wide, sprawling rack of a caribou. Now, since all caribou, the males and the females, have antlers, it's logical for that antler spread to be an immediate sign of safety from one caribou to another in the fall. So I crawled towards that big bull on my belly, moving when it wasn't looking my way. Then I caught its attention when I stood up. With my arms above my head in the shape of a caribou rack, I sauntered towards it and it stood watching, wondering, maybe I was another caribou. But maybe I shouldn't have turned my body sideways. I think that gave me away. This encounter at close range with a big bull gave me as much excitement as taking my trophy bull the day before. I had 200 pounds of meat for the table and memories that still get me excited. So excited that I'll be back in Alaska with Gary Pogany next year. The Alaskan frontier is another world, a part of America that everyone should experience.